Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's really good to be with all of you. You might know, like I, I said this last one, but I want to give credit for attending this class. I really enjoy being here, and this is, I think, the best class on all of campus. I want to acknowledge quickly uh, uh, Trustee Sydney Nakin. You want to stand up, uh, Trustee Sydney? Uh, she's with us today, and she's on the Board of Trustees with me, so thank you for attending with us. Um, and just a quick question who's going to the Cat Hole today? That was, wasn't that an amazing experience to visit with cats, so we'll see. <laughs> I'm really delighted today to, to introduce uh, someone that I think so highly of, someone who I'm all behind. Uh, very seldom do I get political at all, but in this instance, uh, Spencer is one of us. Uh, there's individuals who have to fight, night fight their way into things, and then there's individuals who are a little more blue blood. And so I have great love and respect for individuals who are night fighters. Spencer comes out of uh, also Central Southern Utah. Uh, he, uh, uh, he graduated uh, with an associate's degree from Snow College. I think he went to Utah State. Mm -hmm. And then Washington University or something. Washington and Lee, yep. Okay, great. Yeah. So yeah, the only thing that I don't like about Spencer is he is an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Recovering attorney. <laughs> Recovering attorney. Uh, Spencer is the real deal, you guys. He was the, the mayor of Fairview and then city council, and then he went to the legislature where it was tapped uh, to then be the lieutenant governor. He's been that since 2016. The thing I really love about Spencer is he took his family business, which was telephones, and then turned that business into a major uh, venture that controls the fiber that runs up and down I-15. And so, uh, particularly like the Silicon Slopes area. So, Spencer has actually uh, done the exact, the bootstrap lean startup model and knows how to fight through it just like we do. So, it's really an honor. So important. He is the only candidate that I've ever seen that he and his wife, and Abby, why don't you stand up? And <laughs> She's the lovely side of uh, Spencer, and uh, they, they're the parents of four amazing children. As a matter of fact, one of their children goes to SU. That's right. Yeah. which we're really delighted about. A couple of fun little facts about the answers. He hates dark chocolate. I kind of knew that. <laughs> he loves Utah jazz, and I think can he and uh, uh, Joe Ingalls kind of have a romance. Or something, right? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so really, really fun. The thing that I didn't realize about Spencer was that he's good friends with Lynn Emanuel. Lynn manuel Miranda. Miranda. Yeah, yeah. Does everybody know who that is, or does anybody know how? Who's been to Hamilton? Like, I love Hamilton, what an amazing, uh, what an amazing musical that is. So now I've got to have an introduction there because my wife and I can't get enough. So uh, I'm always singing my favorite song, and you guys can help me, is this, today we're in the room where it happens. <laughs> so I uh, really uh, invite you and welcome you, and thank you for coming down, Spencer, and so grateful to have you here. And uh, this is going to be a really hungry group of students. This isn't your entitled kids, this is street fight. I love it. So thanks so much. Thank you, Rich. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be with you today. I'm so honored. I'm really excited about Entrepreneurship Club. Is that like Fight Club? I, I don't know. Can we talk about it? Is it okay? All right, good. No, it sounds amazing. Um, I, I appreciate that, that kind introduction by Rich. It's great to be here. Uh, anybody know where Sampy County is? I know one guy down here does, because we grew up here. A few of you do. Hey, Sampy County is right in the middle of the state. So if you take a map of Utah and point to the middle of it, you'll be pointing to Sampy County. I was born and raised in the town of Fairview, which is, uh, you may have heard of Ephraim or Manti. Those are the big cities in Sampy. Um, Fairview is a smaller one on the north end. That's where I grew up. Grew up on the farm that my great, great, great grandfather settled uh, 160 years ago. We've been there ever since. Um, we don't get out much, um, but I was, I was determined to change that. And so I uh, went to North Sampy High School in Mount Pleasant where I met my wife who was just introduced to you, Abby. Uh, we went to high school together. She grew up on a farm in Mount Pleasant and uh, we, uh, we couldn't wait to get out of there. We swore we're going to leave and never, ever go back. So we went uh, all the way to Snow College. 
which wasn't exactly leaving, I guess. It was only uh, 10 minutes away, but um, that's where, where we started. And we went to Utah State University, the big city of Logan, and, uh, and then went to Washington and Lee. I went to law school in Virginia, um, came back uh, to work for a big law firm in Salt Lake, realized very quickly, much like Rich, that I didn't like attorneys that much, um, and, uh, which was a problem because I was one. And in fact, we saw a bumper sticker that said it's 99% of attorneys that give the other 1% a bad name. And uh, Abby explained the joke to me. And uh, I, uh, I realized after a while that this is not exactly what we wanted for our, for our lives. About that time, my dad called me and said, hey, how would you like to come back and uh, take a big cut in pay, raise your kids on the farm, and help me run the, uh, the family business. And I'm gonna tell you more about that. Um, I couldn't say no, and so we did the thing we swore we would never do. We moved back to the small town of Fairview, which is where we have been for the uh, past 16 years, I guess seven, almost 17 years now. Um, yes, I do drive 200 miles round trip every day to the capital, and uh, 100 miles up and 100 miles back. It's a, it's a crazy life, about 60,000 miles a year, but it's been very rewarding. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. In fact, I have to go back. I have to go way back to 1903 because that's where our entrepreneurial journey starts, okay? Um, 1903, if you want to start a business, right, you've got to find a reason. You've got to find a niche. What is it that people really want? And in 1903, the thing that people in Fairview really wanted was this new invention. Um, it was called the telephone. And uh, the telephone hadn't made its way to Fairview, even though it had been around for, uh, for many years. Um, but it had made its way to Mount Pleasant, again, where my wife grew up, about six miles south of Fairview. But the company that controlled telephones, the predecessor to the Ma Bell in the state, which doesn't mean anything to you anyway, um, but uh, just know that, that all the, the phone company was kind of one ubiquitous company back then and uh, for, a, for a long time. And, uh, but, but, but they wouldn't bring phones to Fairview because there weren't enough people and it was going to be too expensive. So four enterprising farmers in the town of Fairview decided that they were going to make it happen. And so they got their horses and their wagons and they cut down trees that they made into poles and they pooled their money together. They got a loan. They got, some, uh, they got an open wire line and they brought the first four telephones into Fairview in 1903. Now... That, uh, that was it. That was their niche. They'd figure that out. My family, they were farmers. My, uh, my great-great-great-grandfather, as I mentioned, uh, he started a, a farm in Fairview. It eventually became a dairy farm. They brought in cows, so uh, milking cows. And uh, that was the, uh, the family business. And they, they had, they'd gotten a little money along the way. And, uh, and so his, uh, his grandson in 1919, still running the farm now, but with the growing family, realizing that the farm wasn't going to be enough to support the family, he decided to buy the telephone company from those, uh, those four farmers. He was very entrepreneurial in nature, thought he could really take it to the next level. Now, the company had exploded from four telephones in 1903 all the way to... Uh, 25 telephones in 1919. So you can see this was a real going concern, right? It really taken off. Everybody wanted these telephones. So he bought the company and that's what they did. They had the farm and the company. Uh, life went on and uh, as, as he got older, he, he knew he wasn't going to be around much longer, decided that he was going to uh, d divide up his, his assets to his children. He had two boys in particular, um, my grandfather and his brother, my great uncle. Now, the, uh, he decided to give the farm to my grandfather and the telephone company to his brother. We got the bad end of that deal. So we got the farm and, and nothing to do with the company. So my grandfather took over the farm. Again, was a dairy farmer. Very, very poor. Um, had the, the farm did not do much for them. He had six boys. They lived in about an 800-square-foot home, very, very small home. Uh, the boys were all in, in one room, and uh, they... Uh, um, they, they just struggled in life. But the thing was, they didn't know they were struggling um, because, as my grandpa always said, um, the Great Depression ended, um, but they forgot to tell Fairview and uh, Sanpete County. So everyone was poor, and that's just kind of the way things were. Um, and, and so that was, that was their, their life. Now, my, uh, my, my dad was the fifth child, fifth of the six boys, 
and uh, his brothers kind of grew up. His oldest brother went to college. Um, the next three uh, did not. Um, uh, two of them become, became truck drivers. One of them became a, um, a, a mechanic. And, uh, and, and my, my dad decided he wanted to go to school. So he went to Snow College. And, uh, and got an associate's degree, was going to, to transfer to a university when his dad got very sick with cancer. Um, so he had to move back home and, and run the farm. Uh, my grandfather passed away um, eventually when I was, just after I was born. I, I think I was one when he, when he passed. And, uh, and so here was my dad, had a little bit of school. Um, but he, uh, he was running the farm, but the farm, there was no way that the farm could provide for my grandmother and, and for, for my dad's family as we were kind of starting out. And so, uh, so he had this entrepreneurial bug. He, he just, he, he thought a little differently and, and he worked really hard. So him and his brother and the mechanic, they started a company. Um, they started selling snowmobiles. They thought that that would be a, a great venture for them. There's great snowmobiling up, uh, if you've ever been up Fairview Canyon, um, the, the, uh, the Skyline Drive, some of the best snowmobiling in the world. If you like that kind of stuff, you should go. It's, it's really incredible. So they started this, this company together. And, uh, and he also went to work for his uncle who was running the, uh, the telephone company. So this is the mid-70s now. Um, the company hasn't really grown much at all. It's still called the, well, they just changed it from Fairview Telephone to Central Utah Telephone, okay? So they were, they, they really set their minds big. They're not just Fairview, but we're going for Central Utah. They they did end up buying uh, another thriving community um, that you may have heard of. It was Fountain Green. So it had Fairview and Fountain Green where they had the telephone companies there. And, uh, and that was it. And they were, the company was always struggling, always on the verge of bankruptcy. My, uh, my great uncle um, wasn't a great businessman, but he was a great human being, which means that he didn't really care if people didn't pay their bills. Um, and so he got taken advantage of a lot. Um, they would have a collection list of my along and he would go to try to collect the money and he would hear their story about why they couldn't pay and he just wouldn't make them pay. And uh, that wasn't, it wasn't great for business, um, but it was good for, for people. And, and so the business struggled and struggled and struggled. Eventually, my dad had to get out of the snowmobile business just to focus on the, on the telephone business and helping the company survive. So the, uh, the first lesson I mentioned was, again, finding your niche. You know this. This is, this is pretty basic stuff. But the second one is what happens when, uh, when something bad happens. And, and these are the lessons that I think can really make or break young entrepreneurs. Because inevitably, in every story, and I'm sure every speaker you've, you've heard, um, has told you about tough times that they had in their business. When something didn't go the way they expected, and uh, they were on the verge of losing everything. everything. Sometimes they do lose everything, right? And and they have to keep trying and keep starting over. In, in this case, um, the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. And, uh, and then, and by the way, they had, I think they had about five employees at this time. We're now into the early 80s, okay? So again, from 1903, with those four farmers running the company, to 1983, um, the, uh, uh, they, they'd grown to five whole employees, right? So this is a lot of bootstrapping going on over the course of, uh, of 70 years, 80 years, okay? Um, so this time, though, they had actually acquired a, a tiny... Anybody ever heard of the town of Thistle? Okay, a couple of you have heard of Thistle? Thistle no longer exists, right? Thistle is a ghost town. Have any of you driven on Highway 89 and seen a house kind of buried in the water, half a house sticking up. It's a great Instagram place um, now, apparently. I don't know. I see kids taking pictures there all the time. But um, here's what happened. So Thistle, so they had Fairview, they had uh, Fountain Green, and they had the little town of Thistle, a few homes um, about, um, about 20 minutes south of Spanish Fork, okay, in, in the middle of the canyon there. And uh, in 1983, we had a lot of snow, right? We had all of the snowpack, 82, 83, in the mountains. And uh, the, the snow stayed for a long, long time. So record snow, and it was really cold in the spring. And so there was, uh, there, there was not very much runoff. And then all of a sudden, the weather turned very warm in May. 
Okay, so we had like 90 degree days and all of the snow started to melt and we started to have mudslides and the rivers were overflowing. Um, there's some cool video. There was a river running right through Salt Lake City. City Creek overflowed and they had to, uh, they had to put sandbags along State Street for the water to flow down. Um, just a crazy year. Well, there was a huge mudslide in Thistle and the mudslide came down and, uh, and blocked the river. And the river started to, to flood and, and to grow. And there was this huge uh, concern that if the, the natural dam that had been built, right, by the, uh, the mudslide broke, the water would, would wash down and, and, and potentially wash out Spanish Fork and, and some of these areas. So, so very, very dangerous. One of the biggest natural disasters we've had in the state. Of course, the town of Thistle had to be evacuated immediately as it filled up with water and, and everything was submerged in water, including... Um, our telephone system that was there, the company's telephone, Central Utah Telephone's uh, main building there in, was, was now covered in water. So what, what happened was the, um, the, the archaeologists got together with, uh, with our, our state emergency managers and everybody met together and they said, look, our only chance here is to actually build a dam. But we can't build a dam the way you traditionally build a dam because there is already water flowing in, right? And, and getting, getting bigger and bigger. So what we've got to do is we have to build an earthen dam. So we're going to have to get on top of this mudslide and we're going to have to move all the dirt we can move and, and build up this dam and then put a spillway over the top to keep the river flowing until we can drain this, this new lake that was forming. So that's what they did. They built, it was really incredible, quite the story, um, something that, that, that has been talked about for, for years and years, they built the largest earthen dam in the world at that time to, uh, to make sure that they could regulate the water. Well, here's the problem. They needed communications at that, at that site as quickly as possible. And uh, we had to restore communications. Now, one of the things, when you're a telephone company, you have to connect to everyone else. You have to connect to the outside world. And the place we connected to the outside world was just outside of Thistle, just north of Thistle. In fact, uh, you know where the windmills are in Spanish Fork? Some of you have seen those, those big windmills. That's, that's near the location where we connected with the outside world. So suddenly, this company that was struggling already um, was now facing their demise. And they basically had two choices. They could just go out of business and be done and, and maybe sell the company, let someone else come over, or they could figure it out. But the problem was to figure it out, they were going to have to buy a switch, which is the, 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 the mechanism that connects phones. So when you make a call, the call goes into a building and then it has to be switched and connect with the outside world. The switch was underwater. To, to get a new switch up and running usually took about a year. This is back in the days of analog. It's not digital like it is today with a computer that does that. These were big, heavy pieces of equipment that talked to each other and actually physically moved up and down as you pushed, a, as you dialed on the rotary phone, which means nothing to you. But um, those those buttons would send a pulse down the line into this into this giant mainframe uh, uh, switch, and then it would physically move based on the number you had dialed and then a connect in and provide a, a continuous connection to move on. So that, that's how all of this worked. And they had to, so, so they, they, they decided they were these two young boys, it was my dad and his cousin at this time, you know, they, were, they were, had their young families, they, they decided to go all in on figuring this out. They found a switch in, uh, I think, Michigan. They were able to put it on, a, get it on a truck, get it out here. They worked 24 hours a day over the course of several weeks. They brought in some help to do this, uh, and, and they, they brought in a helicopter to lay the wire that was all underwater now. They had to get new wires and strung them out. Uh, it was an, an enormous expense um, that they, they incurred. Again, putting the, their, their lives, their homes, their families, all now on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, but somehow they were able to pull this off, and uh, and, and and dealing with with adversity really changed them, and it changed their outlook. They realized that if they could do that, they could do anything. They became much more willing to take risks after that. Um, they they got the phones up. They were able to connect the phones to the the uh, to the the companies that were bringing building up this earthen dam. Um, and uh, and the good news is there was some emergency money that they were they were able to get from the government 
government to help pay for what they, what they were able to do. So that saved them, got them through to the next piece, and uh, they were able to move on. But those, those two young men at that time decided, hey, wait a minute, if we can do this, we can do anything. So that was the lesson. The lesson was sometimes being an entrepreneur means you really do have to take risks, um, and when things go wrong, you have to swerve, you have to figure it out, and that's what they did. Now, the, uh, the company after that started to grow. They started to make some acquisitions. They, brought the, they bought the, uh, the town of Moroni, another, another big town. Um, then they bought uh, Garden City. Anybody know where Garden City is? Bear Lake. Some of you been up to Bear Lake? So Garden City, the, 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 the huge town of Schofield. Have you heard of Schofield? Maybe, maybe not. Eureka, uh, Goshen. So what was happening was the big company um, didn't care about these little towns because they weren't making enough money, so they were willing to sell them and sell them pretty cheap. So that's what they started to do. They started buying up all of these, these small assets strategically around the state wherever they could. Um, the company started to grow and uh, grew to, uh, to be about 40 employees in 2003 when I got the call to come back, okay? And, and the call from, from my dad was something like this. Look, we're going to be retiring someday, and uh, we, we, uh, we're, we, you know, management and the family is very important to us. Um, and not only that, but we've got to figure out what to do when people no longer have phones on their walls, right? Because from 1903 to 2003, Everybody had a telephone on their wall. That's just what you did. That's how you communicated with the rest of the world. Um, but in the 90s, we started getting these devices, right? And, and they were cell phones. They didn't look anything like this, by the way, in 2003. This was not a thing yet. Um, but uh, we had these, these brick phones, and then they started to get smaller and smaller, and then the cool kids had like a flip phone. And uh, we knew that people were going to start, start cutting the cord, and they weren't going to have telephones anymore. And, uh, and so they had started offering over telephone lines. They figured out they could move data. So they started offering internet, right? And, and it, way back then, we had dial-up internet. So you, your computer, your modem would physically dial a number to connect in, and, uh, and then you could transmit data. But the, the data speeds were obviously very, very slow. So our company was doing that because if you were in the telephone business, that meant you could be in the internet business overnight. So you just add some equipment to those phone lines, and you could make that work. And then they figured out how to do high-speed internet, DSL, over a phone line. So suddenly now we could be in the internet business. And so we started to grow that. And, and, and as we came back, we started to look at it. Where was our company going to be in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years? Um, I, I said, I really think this internet is going to take off. I think it's going to be a thing. So we should probably stick with that. So let, let's see what we can do on the internet side. Let's try to get as many customers as we can. And so we started buying. Now, the, the big companies were getting rid of small cable TV companies, right? Um, and so these cable TV companies in rural Utah, uh, Richfield and that area came up for sale. Um, Delta and, and uh, that, that area of Millard County came up for sale. So we started buying these because what we decided was um, having a pipe, a wire into someone's house would always be important or could always be important. And the more of those wires we had, even cell phones, you may not know this, but you have to have wires for cell phones to work because your calls go to a cell tower. But you know what happens after they get to a cell tower? Actually get on a wire to travel somewhere else. That still connects the world. Um, and so we wanted to be the company that was in the, that pipe business, in that wire business, as much as we could. And we wanted to make those pipes as big as possible because what we knew is that people were getting addicted to the internet. They were doing more and more on the internet. That mattered to people. I started giving speeches in 2004 about how someday people would watch TV over the internet. I got laughed out of a lot of rooms. People told me that was not a thing and that that would never happen, that we would never have the speeds or the compression to be able to do that. Um, and yet, I'm guessing all of you watch TV over the internet, right? You watch, you watch your content over the internet now. And so we wanted that wire, not because we thought cable TV was going to be a big seller in the future, not because we thought telephones were going to be a big seller in the future, but because we knew we could, if we had the wire, we could always get higher and higher speeds as the technology improved. So that was our, that was, that was our goal, that, that was our, our pivot um, to save the company that had been doing nothing but telephones from, since 1903. So um, fast forward a little bit, though. 
We, we, we knew we had to get, we were in rural Utah, central Utah telephone, but we were thinking bigger than that. We thought, could we compete um, in the population centers of the state of Utah? Can we get to the Wasatch Front and what would that look like? Now, unfortunately, it's getting more and more expensive to put in wires because people don't like wires above the ground, which is the cheapest way to do it. You put up a pole, you hook a wire to it, and you can do it very cheaply, right? That people don't like that. It's ugly. Um, it's it, they also, you know, subject to weather and, and all kinds of things that happen. Um, and, and we knew we had to get these wires underground, which is what we had been doing for years and years now, was putting them underground. And we got really good at it in rural Utah. Um, we had backhoes, and we could dig, and we could put those wires in. But, um, of course, Provo and Salt Lake look a little different than, than rural Utah. So we weren't sure we could compete up there. Also, it's very, very expensive to put wires underground. Not as expensive if you live you know, out in rural Utah, but much more expensive if you live in urban Utah. How do you get those wires where they need to go? And so we, we bought a, um, a drill that they call, call them. Um, these, are, these are directional bores that go under, underneath the ground. They're, they're very expensive, but again, this was a, a huge investment for our company. Uh, we started to train our employees, and we were training them in, in rural Utah. We would train them, though, where there were lots of rocks and areas so we could kind of figure out how to, how to navigate these things and, uh, and see if we could compete once we got there. But we just knew we didn't have the capital to make that happen. Now, here's the next lesson. Um, well, first of all, we changed our name from Central Utah Telephone to Centricom, all right? Thinking a lot more bigger. How can, we, we don't want to be geographically limited, but we changed our name. But more importantly, um, we had to figure out a way to use other people's assets to help us get where we needed to go? How could we leverage what we had to help others? And this is where a good entrepreneur looks to the future and, and always thinks 20 and 30 years ahead. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. The company put in their first fiber optic line in the, in the late 90s. Remember I told you we had to connect with, uh, with, out by the windmills with the rest of the world? The line we had up there was getting old and didn't carry enough, uh, it couldn't carry enough capacity. And so we decided to put in a fiber optic line in the, in the late 90s, my dad and his cousin. So, so what happened was as they were doing that, they had to get permits to go down Highway 6 through Spanish Fork Canyon. Now, if any of you know anything about Highway 6, um, it was considered the most dangerous um, highway in America for a long time. It's a lot safer now because UDOT has made some changes and added some lanes in certain places. This was a very dangerous place, very crazy place. And there isn't much room to, on the side of the roads to get anything in those roads. But we had gotten a permit. We had managed to get a permit through there. And uh, again, we do all, all of this construction ourselves. My dad's cousin is really good at this stuff. So they were going to put in this. And at the last minute, just as they were about to do this, so open up a trench, put in this fiber down the side of this very narrow, very dangerous highway, um, my dad said, you know, as long as we're doing this, as long as we're going to have a trench open, why don't we put in an empty conduit? So again, a conduit is just a pipe with, with nothing in it. What if we just threw in an empty conduit just in case we ever need it? Now, again, with fiber optics, fiber optics use light waves to, uh, to, to, to uh, carry information, right? And you can put millions of calls on two fiber, right? And, and, and they were putting in more than that. I, I can't remember if they put in a 24 count fiber, 36 count fiber, something like that. But it's, it's so thin, right? So a 36 count fiber is a tube about like that. And uh, they were going to do that anyway. They thought that's enough capacity for the next thousand years for our company. Why would we ever need any more than that? But my dad just said, what if we just put in an empty conduit? It wouldn't cost much more at all, right? Because the trench is already open. Um, empty pipe is cheap. So let's just do it just in case we ever need it. So they did that. They put it in, then they kind of forgot about it, that it was there. Now again, fast forward, we're trying to figure out a way to get onto the Wasatch Front. And uh, we remember that we have, and we have some great employees who are thinking through this, remember that we have this empty conduit that's been there forever. And somebody had heard that UDOT, the Department of Transportation, because this was such a dangerous highway, they needed traffic cameras um, all along this, this highway so they could see when it was snowing, they could see if there was an accident, they could monitor the roads. And uh, at this time, UDOT was trying to connect all of their, their traffic signals and all of their traffic cameras. So UDOT had been putting in empty conduits for years. Um, they'd been putting empty conduits along I-15 
they had, and they would often put in eight conduits, sometimes as much as 16 conduits, in the, just in case they ever needed them in these right of ways. But then UDOT was never using them for anything. I mean, they would use one, again, to connect these, these traffic lights, but then they had all these empty ones and nothing, nothing to use them for. Now, UDOT has budget constraints as well, right? They, they're always struggling because they, it's taxpayer money. They never have enough money for what they want to do. So they could never afford a big project just to hook up some traffic cameras up that, that dangerous canyon. So we went to them and say, hey, we know you need cameras up this canyon, and they didn't have any conduit. So we have this empty conduit. We have no idea what we're going to do with it. We're willing to give it to you. It won't cost you anything. We'll give you this conduit, you know, 18 miles of conduit, however many it was, and uh, you can put your traffic cameras up there. And then why don't you just give us one of your empty conduits along I-15, which, of course, we could never get. If, even if you could get the right-of-way, it would be so expensive to do. That it just, it's just impossible. Why don't you give us one of your empty conduits? We'll make a trade. It won't cost us anything. And all of a sudden, we're in. We're into Utah County, we're into Salt Lake County, all the way into downtown Salt Lake City. And uh, they thought that was the best idea they had ever heard. Um, and all of this happened because somebody just thought at the last minute, thinking ahead, I don't know what we're going to do with it, but this could make a big difference maybe sometime down the road. And it did. It changed everything for us. That conduit that probably cost to throw in an extra conduit, I don't know, maybe $20,000, um, turned out to be worth maybe $10 million to our company I, over time. Um, just incredible, that little bit of foresight. And so now, I'm very proud to say, if you drive along I-15 and you drive up to, through Lehigh and you see all of those new buildings going up in Silicon Slopes, right, where all the entrepreneurs are changing the world, most of those new buildings are running on fiber out of the little Fairview Telephone Company that started in 1903 um, because four farmers wanted telephones. And uh, it, it, it's, it's just incredible to see what's happening. The company now has about 120 employees um, doing, I think, about probably about $40 million a year now. Um, imagine 120 employees uh, for a company um, in a town that only has 1,200 people in it, right? It's a really, really big deal for a lot of people. The last thing I want to share with you, and then, uh, and then I'd love to open it up for questions. We can talk about anything you want to talk about. Um, the real success behind the company, though, wasn't just looking around the corner, getting over hard times, trying to figure out what's next, and, uh, and being willing to, to, to pivot and make those hard decisions. Um, the real success of the company are the people that, that work there. Um, I would love to take credit for all the great things that have happened at that company, and I can't. I can't take credit for any of it, because we have the most incredible employees anywhere. Now, they did sell the company. Um, several years ago, uh, knowing the way telecom was changing so rapidly and technology was changing so rapidly, and knowing that, there would, uh, that they needed deeper pockets just to keep the company going, they decided to, uh, to look at selling the company after 100 years. And, uh, and, and so they looked, and they, they looked at potential buyers, and they found one buyer in particular who said their model was, they owned 13 companies like this across the country, their model was we keep management in the family, um, that was really important to them. Um, the, 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 the customer will never know that the company had been sold. Their model was to keep everything local. And uh, that was something that really, that our family was really interested in. And so uh, completed the transaction and went along doing business. And so now we have 12 other companies just like ours all across the country from California to Vermont um, that are doing the same types of things, telephone and internet in mostly rural places but trying to get into urban places. And uh, a couple things happened, though, with our bosses. So there's a holding company out of New York that, um, that bought the company. And uh, they, they, they would look at us, and they would see that we were doing things a little differently than everyone else. Um, we were incredibly generous with our employees. Um, every year, we gave the biggest bonuses um, to our employees, to everyone. 
the, uh, the janitor got a big bonus. Everyone got a big bonus at Christmas as, uh, because the company was doing so well and was so successful. We also were, were paying our employees more than, than uh, these other companies. And there was a little pushback on that. Oh, and by the way, the third thing was we're very generous in, in our community. So every year we have a company-wide service project where we take a day, um, we, we have a skeleton crew running the company, we, we actually have a school bus, we load all the employees up in a school bus, and we go to a different community, and we, do some, we load all of our heavy equipment, and we do the biggest project that they've been waiting to do, like you know, building a baseball field, or just something that that community has needed for years and never been able to accomplish. Um, we would do that. We would, we, would, uh, our, it, we would pay our employees to volunteer in schools, um, in, our, in our local elementary schools. Um, and, and the company, uh, the, the parent company is looking at all of this and saying, this is bad for business. Why, why are you doing this? That impacts the bottom line, right? That's going to hurt our company um, if you're doing all of those things. You can't pay people to not work. You know, you're paying people to volunteer. That's, that's, that can't be good for our bottom line. Why, why are you doing this? And, uh, and so we started pushing back on them and saying, trust us. You, you, you wanted us for a reason. We're the most successful of the, of the companies. Um, you, there's a reason we're the most successful, and that's because we invest in our people. And in turn, our people then give their very best to us. Um, we had lower turnover rates than any of the other companies. We have people who are, have been with us for 30, 40 years, um, and, and it was the, you know, the place that everyone wanted to work. And it was because we took care of our people. And, and I do believe that that's a lesson and, and something that, that is changing in our country. I think it's changing for the better. Um, we, uh, we talk about capitalism, and, and I am a capitalist in every sense of the word. And uh, that is, free enterprise is how we built this nation. Um, it's how we built this state. It's why we are, by the way, the most successful state in the country right now. Um, we have, our unemployment is at 2.3%, the lowest it's been in the history of our state. It's the lowest in the country right now. Over the last 10 years, um, we have seen a, um, uh, a we, we have led the nation in private sector job growth. 36% increase in private sector jobs over the past 10 years. The next closest state, 27%. So not only are we leading, but we're, we're leading by leaps and bounds. Right? We are a free enterprise entrepreneurial state. It's part of, it's in our DNA. I, I, from the time, you know, in 1847, when, when those pioneers came here and thought, wow, we, we've got to start, there's nothing here. Um, and, and uh, you know, they built schools like this school uh, because they were entrepreneurial in nature. They knew how to make things work. That, that's who we are. But, but, but capitalism without heart um, is, is dangerous, right? And, and we're, we're seeing that, unfortunately, we have a younger generation who is, who is rejecting capitalism in so many ways, which I will tell you is much more dangerous than capitalism with no heart. Um, but there is, there is a better way, and we see that here in Utah. Again, it's part of our DNA. It's not just our company. It's all, it, it's, you see it here at the Dixie Levitt Center, right? The Levitt family, entrepreneurs who have been incredibly successful and gave back to the community. Um, Gail Miller, Right, N named after the, this this entrepreneur program, after the Miller family, um, people like Rich, Christensen, who have been successful and understand it's important to give back. It's part of who we are. We have to give back. Utah, I. I told you some statistics I'm very proud of. The two I'm most proud of is that Utah leads the nation in charitable giving and Utah leads the nation in volunteerism every year and there's not a close second. That's what makes Utah so special and so unique. That's how we're able to do what we do. That's what made Centricom so successful. It wasn't, obviously the good ideas mattered, the willingness to sacrifice mattered, the, the willingness to do all of the hard things that entrepreneurs have to do mattered, but without the people it never would have maintained the success that it's had now for 117 years, okay? Um, I, I say all of that to, to say this. Um, now in the state of Utah, we, we have the, um, we changed the law several years ago, something I'm very proud of, um, so that you can actually have a benefit corporation here in the state. Um, you don't have to just think about the bottom line. Now, 
Don't get me wrong, the bottom line matters, right? If you're not making money, you're not gonna be able to do any good anywhere. It doesn't matter how, how charitable you are. If you don't make money, you can't give it away, right? So you have to be successful there. But um, under the, the, the benefit corporation statute of the state of Utah now, you can actually consider some other things in, uh, in your company and in those determinations. So you can, of course, consider the bottom line, which matters, but you can also consider your employees um, and giving back to your employees. You can consider the environment, um, making conservation, making the, the air cleaner, water cleaner, all of those things that, that, that matter. And you can consider charitable giving as well. And so we are seeing an explosion in benefit corporations here in the state of Utah. Corporations who, who um, have a great business idea, but also have a charitable piece to their model, a way to give back and uh, make the world a better place. Now, I want to open it up to questions, but I want to say this. Rural Utah continues to struggle. I've talked about the good things that are happening in our state with unemployment and job growth. Unfortunately, not every county in our state has seen that type of, of growth. In fact, we still have four counties that since the end of the Great Recession are still recessing. They're still in a recession. Even though we've had the greatest period of prosperity in our state's history, some counties are not seeing that. Um, we can talk about incentives, and, and that's important to get businesses to move into rural Utah and to help change things. But I am here to tell you that the only way that is ever going to change is rural entrepreneurs. Um, young people like you who maybe grew up in that area, who have an idea, can start a business and run a business uh, where you're located, or those who have gone on to have great business success somewhere else in the state or the country or the world and are willing to come back to their hometowns and help make it better. We need a generation of entrepreneurs in rural Utah, and, and we have the tools to do that now. That's the great thing, and of course I'm biased because of my background, um, about technology and the internet. It gives you access to markets. It gives you access to markets across the world, and it doesn't matter where you live now to be able to do some of those things. Now, of course, there are some things that you, you, you still can't do in rural Utah, but, but the, there are so many possibilities now, and we're counting on you to help solve those problems and make it work. So no pressure, um, but, but you're going you're gonna to save us and fix all the mistakes we've made. Now, um, questions. Anything you've ever wanted to ask the lieutenant governor but didn't know we had one, um, now is <laughs> your chance. We can talk. We we can talk politics, we can talk business, we can talk to Utah Jazz, uh, we can talk anything you want. I should say, by the way, that um, after, um, after I got elected to the House of Representatives, uh, those were all part-time uh, kind of hobbies. Uh, I was r helping to run the business. Um, when the governor asked me to be lieutenant governor in uh, 2013, uh, it was a very hard decision for us because we knew we, we weren't going to leave Fairview, so it meant another cut in pay. We were going the wrong direction. It meant, uh, it meant um, commuting 200 miles round trip every day, um, and it meant time away from my family and the, the things that we love. Ultimately decided it was the right thing to do, said yes. So I, I no longer have any interest in the company. Um, I, I haven't worked there for, uh, for now six, six and a half years, and they're, they're still doing great, great things. They're, they're expanding and doing well, but um, I've been in the political world now for the past six and a half years. So questions? Did I see a hand over here? Please. Well, Yeah. It's very rare and it's very hard. It, it can be the best of times or it can be the worst of times and there's really nowhere in between, all right? What I will say is this. Um, you have to, when you go into business with family and what's really cool about my dad and his cousin is they are best friends. Um, they are the best partners this, that I've ever seen in this world. They complement each other very well. They have different skill sets. Um, it's, there, there are some hard times as the next generation comes in, right? Because um, I was working there. Uh, I have a couple siblings that work there. My, uh, my dad's cousin has a couple of his kids that work there as well. And so those things, those things can be very, very difficult. Uh, just, just some advice. Um, one, I think it's important to have very clear clear uh, lines of communication always. Um, you have to be very open. When, uh, when somebody's getting their feelings hurt, you actually have to talk about it very, very quickly. Don't let those things type of fest. By the way, this, this is true of every organization, not just family. It just seems to be even more poignant when it's family. Um, I do think it's important to have very clear delineations of duties. 
um, so that everyone knows what they're responsible for, that we're holding each other accountable. Um, I will also say this, I think it's important that every kid that gets into the family business does something else first. Um, don't just come into the business and start in the business and stay in the business. Um, me and my siblings have all gone to school. Um, we've worked somewhere else before we came back. Um, I think it's important to have those life experiences. And then you bring something to the table when you do come back to the, uh, to the family business. So, um, so all of those things are important. Um, but I, I, too, have seen far too many where they start out great and then they, they don't end up great. And a lot of people get their feelings hurt and then they don't talk to each other and it, it can be the worst. But when it works, there's nothing, nothing better. Thank you. Other questions? Please. No, no, it's a really good question. And so I, I would say a couple things. So first of all, I mentioned that, that this, this kind of idea of giving back. So this has been ingrained into us and into our family and into our business from the very beginning. My great-grandfather, when he bought the business, again, was notorious for just giving back and, and, and helping with, with city projects and events. My great-uncle, the same thing. They, you know, the, the park's named after him because he just gave back to the community. And so this was really ingrained into us. And I think it, this is important and it's part of entrepreneurship and, and, and this idea of giving back. There are lots of different ways to give back. So my cousins um, are, are uh, volunteer firefighters and EMTs, right? Um, I'm, I don't like fire or blood, um, either of those things, uh, but I had a skill set where one of the ways I could give back and, and having the legal skill set as well was, was very helpful, um, was by getting involved and in, in, in helping with some of these problems. Um, I, I will tell you, so let, let me tell you how I got involved first of all. So when I moved back to Fairview, a friend of mine came and said, there's a vacancy on the city council and uh, we're, you know, we, we can't, um, we, 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 well, he said, we've decided to appoint you to fill the vacancy. And uh, so it wasn't an election yet. Somebody had just moved. And I said, well, that's great. You know, why do you think I would be good? And he said, well, it's kind of your turn. Um, you can't get anybody else to do it. You know, that's, that's kind of how it works in these small towns. But he said, he said also, and this is the real reason, he said, we have a, uh, we have a big legal problem. And we, we, uh, we can't afford an attorney. We were hoping if we appointed you to the this, this city council, you would do free legal work for us. And uh, so that's kind of how I got involved, was really this idea of giving back. Now, as I've been able to do different things in different arenas, and now as lieutenant governor, I will tell you that, that we need entrepreneurs in government, right? Because so many of the principles that I've described to you today and that you're learning can be used to improve government, right? But, but let me offer a caution here. Government is not business, okay? As, as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, I would wake up with a good idea, and by the end of that day, we had implemented that good idea. I routinely wake up with good ideas now, and if I'm lucky, a couple years from now, we may have implemented some of those ideas. And here's why. Um, this is the, 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 the good with the bad in government. Government was not designed to solve all of our problems. It, it just wasn't. Now, this isn't a partisan statement. This isn't a conservative Republican saying government's bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying government was not designed to solve all of our problems. Now, I want you to think about design a little bit, okay? Government was designed, the, the best businesses and entrepreneurs are, are design their businesses to be able to respond quickly to an issue, to respond quickly to changing markets, um, to be able to be nimble and, and adjust on the fly, which is, by the way, why we were able to do so well on the Wasatch Front, because these big companies, you would order, you know, you would want a fiber connection to your business, and it would take six months to be there. You know, we could do it in a week, and, and, and that's, that, that's how we were able to gain market share. Government is the exact opposite of that. We didn't, we had that, by the way, 240 years ago, we had a king, he was really nimble, you know, he would wake up in the morning with an idea, they were often bad ideas, but he could implement those very quickly here, right, and we threw a bunch of tea in the ocean and fought off the greatest superpower ever and won, and we thought, you know what, we don't like that model, that model's not good 
when it comes to government. We want government to be very slow. We want government to be methodical. We want to make it really hard to accomplish something. We're going to put checks and balances in place to make sure that no one person has too much power. You would never, ever, ever design a business like we design government. It would, it would la not last a week. Um, and, and so we can say that's a terrible thing, and it certainly has gotten worse. I mean, Washington, D.C. is a dumpster fire, and that's not fair to dumpster fires. It's so bad <laughs> back there. But, what we, uh, but, but it, it was, I think it's important to understand it was built that way on purpose. So what we have to do is we have to understand how can we hack government? How can we use the, the, the power that we do have to be more entrepreneurial, um, to, to lower costs, and, and improve services. Now, by and large, we've been able to do that here in the state of Utah. I'll give you one example. Um, when, uh, when I became lieutenant governor, um, it, the, the average wait time at the DMV, the driver's license when you go in to do your driver's license, the average wait time was 27 minutes. Um, we thought, okay, we don't need the legislature to pass laws to change that. We can change those processes internally, and that's what we did. We were able to streamline these processes, make some changes. The average wait time now is six minutes. So we went from 27 minutes to six minutes, right? That's what a good business would do. Now, the difference with government is there is no competition, right? Um, if, if, you, if, you have tw if your customers have to wait 27 minutes for something, someone else is going to come along and have a six-minute wait time, and you're going to go out of business, right, unless you improve. So you have this natural drive. Competition sharpens you, makes you better. Government doesn't have that. We could still be at 27 minutes, and you all could be put out and be mad, and it's not going to matter because you're not going to form a new government to come in and compete with our government, right? Now, you could run for office and say, I'm going to make wait time sooner. So we do have a little competition there. But by and large, government doesn't have competition. So it, it takes an entrepreneurial mindset to say, even though we don't have competition, let's do it anyway. And let's find a way to make it better and faster and smoother and easier for people. Um, but it's, it's tough. But it has served me very well. And I'm grateful for that background. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question, maybe two. I think we wrap up in four minutes, is that right? Or are we done now? Uh, if we're done now, we can be done now. We got, we got time for a question or two. Okay, more question, please. How important do you think the education is versus like job experience or tech? <sighs> ah, the age old question. Um, the question, if you didn't hear it, was how important do we think it is for um, an education versus experience or a, a trade type tech school? Um, I think they are both very important, and that's a very political answer, but let me tell you something. Let me go a little broader than that. Here at SUU, you're here at SUU for a reason. This really matters. Um, I, I love that you're here, and I love that you're getting especially this type of education. I do think we have made a big mistake as a country over the past uh, 40 years. This, this idea that every kid needs a bachelor's degree is not good for our kids, and it's not good for our economy. Um, there are a bunch of us that do need bachelor's degrees, and this is awesome, and, and you should be here working on these degrees. It will make you better, right? Um, but there are another group of people um, who we've told you have to get a bachelor's degree or you're worth less. There's something wrong with you. And that's, that's bad uh, in so many ways because every one of us is unique. We all have different capacities, right? Um, having a skill matters. Uh, and so I, I, I do believe that we need, by the way, uh, Cash Valley Electric, one of the biggest electric companies in Utah, could hire 400 electricians today in Salt Lake, right now, 400 electricians. Very high paying jobs, great jobs, right? They can't find enough. And, and far too often we're forcing kids to go to college who don't have the capacity or aren't interested. They end up with debt after a couple years and they drop out and don't have a degree. And that's the worst of both worlds, right? So getting people in the right places absolutely matters. But here's the thing. Um, I think both are really, really important. I have a good friend who is very high up, was high up in Amazon. Um, uh, very incredibly successful, lives in New York, uh, works in corporate site location, and uh, it, daughters are brilliant. And he told his daughters he's not going to let them go to college until they have a skill of some sort. So they have to learn welding or programming or something, a, a, or in conjunction with their degree um, at college, they have to do both of those, take a trade at college, he'll, he'll let them do that. But some, something where they have a skill 
and they have a degree. And that's the best of all combinations. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting, and I think it should give us all something to think about. I do think that this is the next evolution of higher education, um, combining those two things, helping people figure out what they want to do with their lives in very positive ways, not just about putting people in seats, but getting people real-world experience. Um, SUU is doing this, by the way. SUU is on the cutting edge of this, which is awesome. But working with entrepreneurs, working with the private sector um, directly to, uh, to get real-world experience and, and combine. We, we've separated education from work for far too long. That's what needs to change, is education and work need to be combined. Because the economy is changing so rapidly, by the way. We, I had a friend, and I'll end here, who said he graduated from college with all the knowledge he needed for the first 30 years of his career. He retired a few years ago. I'm like, I hate to break it to you, but that will never happen again. Right? The economy and, and jobs, the nature of work is changing so rapidly that we routinely graduate people from college who don't have the knowledge they need for the first year of their career. That's not a knock on college. That's how rapidly the workforce is changing. So how do we combine work and education together for the future? That's how we're going to, uh, that's how we're going to solve this next piece and uh, make sure that we have a workforce that can be engaged for generations to come. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing. Keep up the good work. We're proud of you. Stay in school and do your stuff. All right, thanks, you guys. I could, I could just make a couple observations. I, I think we heard some outstanding advice. One is the value of a little bit of forethought in terms of how, how they can, that can pay off long term. Second is treating your employees well and the, and the people who work for you well. And another thing I was really struck by was uh, the reverence and respect for ancestors, the people who came before. And uh, all three of those, I think, are, are great models. Uh, and we'd like to present Spencer with the Cedar Award. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and hope that the cedar, it's made from cedar wood. I, I've cut so many cedar posts in my days. <laughs> uh, I love this. We hope you'll, uh, you'll return to Cedar next time as the governor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.